Okay, we are, we have a quorum. So I'm going to bring this December 14th regular board meeting to order. Um, please stand for the pledge. Flag of the United States of America to the Republic of Origins, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, is Kelly here? Oh, there you are. Hi, Kelly. You want to do roll call? I'm here. Hi. Um, Ms. Flynn? Delayed. Mr. Galloway? Here. Hi, John. Ms. Johnson? Uh, she's delayed. Ms. Ms. Stadler? Here. Mr. Singh? Here. Mr. White? Here. Mr. Wolf? Um, delayed. Ms. Betterbit? Ms. Hewer? Here. Thanks. Uh, we don't need to review the fire exits. Can I have a motion to adopt changes to the order of business on the agenda? Anthony's moved. Laura second. Laura, um, this is just because we're not following our policy of order, which actually is on the agenda tonight to change that we want to do this uh, at every meeting anymore. So thanks. Are there any comments and questions about this? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Um, so I think we're still, we're six now with John. So pass six to zero. Um, we're gonna have a moment of silence. Can everyone please stand for a moment of silence for Mary Pennybacker, a teacher who retired after 23 years of service to the district and Mr. Joseph Mortis, who retired after 30 years of service to the district as a math teacher, guidance counselor, and coach of basketball and cross country. Okay, um, we're going to start with open to the public. Um, Any speaker who wishes to um, to make a comment can say so in the chat, or if you want to use the chat, you can just um, speak up, and you'll have four minutes to speak. Mm -hmm. And please make sure your phone is muted or your computer is muted if you are not trying to make a public comment. Is there anyone that would like to make a public comment tonight? Okay, seeing none, I'm gonna move on to our workshop. Tonight we have Dr. Javon Hunter and our own Eric Wright talking about um, the work that they're doing in our district with teachers for the culturally responsive curriculum. So take it away guys. Yes, good evening, Board of Education. Good evening, Dr. Landau. I want to thank you guys for giving us the opportunity this evening to speak uh, about culturally responsive practices and culturally relevant pedagogy. I'd like to also thank Dr. H Dr. Javon Hunter for joining us this evening um, out, of, out of Buffalo, you know, from the University of Buffalo State, SUNY, SUNY Buffalo State. Um, Dr. Javon Hunter had the opportunity to meet uh, approximately two years ago at a workshop in uh, Duchess Bosey's. And I, um, I was impressed by his presentation on culturally responsive pedagogy. Uh, one for the fact that, um, you know, just, just the manner in which he presented to us as, as educators from teachers on to administrators. And it, it was very eye-opening and engaging throughout. Two for the fact that it was on a Friday and he was able to keep everyone engaged throughout the course of the day. Um, it just says a lot of, uh, about who he is and what he brings to the table. Um, 
Second, another reason why I, I'm, I'm impressed by, uh, by Dr. Javon Hunter, what he brings to the table is that um, he, he actually facilitated uh, a seminar or a leadership, I mean, a series on culturally responsive pedagogy for teachers throughout the county. And um, after doing so, he was so impressed with some of the work by one of the teachers in our, our middle school that he, he spoke about it in another county, presenta county presentation where uh, our very own board member, uh, Anthony White was present and he came back to, to inform us about it. Um, it just shows that to me that he's not only a craftsman, but he's, he's really into the work that he does and um, he gets the results. And um, for that reason, Dr. Landau and, and I felt like, you know, we really need him here working with our teachers. Um, Mike. So culturally responsive teaching, you know, what is it? It's, it's a focus on on the academic and personal success of our students. It's a very different way of looking at uh, working with students. You know, normally we work from the lens of teacher being the, the, the presenter, the being the person with the knowledge and therefore um, students are the receivers of that knowledge. Um, this, this theory is very different. You know, it allows, teach, it allows our students to really become part of that work. You know, it's, it's rigorous. Uh, you know, rigorous and um, which is what's important about it being rigorous is that, you know, we know for a fact that our, our, our kids do better when they have a rich, rigorous curriculum that really opens up, opens them up to learning. You know, their identities and experiences are affirmed. You know, lots of times what happens is that, you know, as educators, there's not a sense of belonging for our students. Using, using culturally responsive teaching, what it does is it really allows our teachers, I mean, our students to be the focus of the learning. Uh, they get to see themselves in the learning. And that's really important if we want our students to, to really be engaged in the learning. You know, additionally, teachers help students develop the tools and skills to engage in the world and others critically. You know, it's very important for our students to, uh, to be able to advocate, you know, advocate for what they see happening in their communities, what they see happening in their schools. By being engaged in the learning and, and really being taught how to advocate for themselves, we can see our, our students going out to lead conversations out in our communities. And that's what learning is really all about. Um, next slide. So what's the main goal of public school education? Um, in 2016, Phi Delta Kaplan, they did a survey uh, that they sent out to over a thousand, a, a thousand people. It was, a, it was a phone survey that was done, a phone poll that was done. And the results stated that 45% felt that the reason or the purpose of education was to prepare students academically. 25% felt that the purpose was to prepare students for work. And 26% um, believed that the purpose is to prepare students to be good citizens. You know, when, when you look at that, this chart, this pie chart, um, it says that, you know, primarily what people really believe is that, um, that you go to school, that kids, our youth go to school and what they're learning is that they're, they're learning about math. They're learning about, you know, the content areas and some of the disciplines of art, phys ed, et cetera, you know. But as a result, that knowledge stays there. It isn't something that helps them, helps to prepare them for the real world. You know, what it helps them is just knowledge that stays there in the present, unless it has a focus that, that ties into the world. You know, when you look at preparing students to be good citizens, you see that it's only 26% of uh, that the, uh, the, the people who took that survey believe that that's what education is, is about. I believe totally that it's about the combination of the three in order to really help our students uh, be prepared for life. 
you know, to to uh, to engage in civic, in in, in civics, and to engage in uh, to engage in real world discussions. You know, so for me, I see uh, culturally responsive pedagogy, culturally responsive practices as a way to get us there. You know, throughout this presentation, what you'll hear from Dr. Uh, Dr. Hunter is you'll hear how you hear what he uses to support our teachers to bring that out of our students. Next slide. So as I was looking at the purpose of education and, and trying to you know, think about it from you know, the lens of especially urban school districts throughout, throughout uh, and city school districts throughout America, you know, um, and I thought about, you know, the purpose over time, you know, in the very beginnings, it was about learning about religion, you know, it was about uh, studying the Bible. From there, it became about uh, producing skilled laborers, what we call job preparation today. Um, today, we look at preparing students to complete, to compete in a global society, you know, what that is to this very day is technology. STEM careers, you know, all good things when you talk about STEM careers and uh, comparing, uh, I mean, com competing in a global society, you know. In addition, preparing students for college. Um, the college aspect is really important. It's tied into uh, learning about the academics. You know, I think it's one dimensional because college isn't for every student, some students will go on to take those trades, but I think that, you know, what we have to do is realize that, you know, uh, let, me, let me take you back for a second. I, I apologize for rambling. Um, preparing our students for college, you know, although very important, you know, when we get focused on it as a singular focus, what happens is we move away from the civic engagement. You know, the civic engagements, as I spoke about earlier, is super important because it allows our students to be able to affect change in the real world, understanding what needs to be done to support uh, their community. Once again, understanding what needs to be done to support, uh, to support, to, or, or to, to, to really uh, move action within the schools. With all that being said, you know, I want to turn this over to Dr. Hunter so uh, he's able to really focus on the work that he's done and has been doing in many school districts throughout our county and up in the uh, in northern region of the state. Thank you, Mr. Wright. I appreciate that. And thank you <clears throat> so much for that, um, that wonderful overview of the uh, purpose of education. Folks, I am going to share my screen with you right now. And if <clears throat> also you will have the opportunity. Um, I did forward a truncated copy of this presentation uh, to Mr. Wright. So to distribute to you all, if you haven't had a chance to get it, the only difference between that version and what you see here is I removed all the images. Uh, so as to protect um, protect the people within um, within these images, but uh, so let me go ahead and get things set up here. Great. Chat. All right. I think we're all set. So folks, if you have any questions, any comments, if you um, don't want to um, unmic yourselves, you can always put them in the Zoom group chat and I will do my best to respond to them. Uh, once again, I wanna thank you all for allowing, for inviting me to, um, to share some of the work that I have done um, around culturally relevant pedagogy. And in many ways, the vision <clears throat> that um, Mr. Wright and I have been discussing uh, for the work in Beacon City Schools. As previously mentioned, my name is uh, Javon Hunter, 
and I am the Woods Beals Endowed Chair for Urban Education at SUNY Buffalo State. Um, at my heart though, I'm a literacy guy, a former ELA teacher from um, in Compton um, Unified School District. I'm not from New York, I'm actually from Southern California. So it's funny, I was just commenting to my wife earlier this evening, looks like we're gonna have a pretty nice winter. I don't do well in the cold. <laughs> I'm not used to it yet. <laughs> so as I mentioned, um, my work really centers on these five different, or focuses on these five different areas. Where as I mentioned, at my heart, I'm a literacy guy looking at youth and working alongside teachers to help think about ways in which we can bring the social realities of our young people into the classroom. Um, also using uh, creatively different ways in which students access technology to talk about the issues of justice that impact their lives. So I've been in uh, Western New York now for 10 years. I've had the opportunity of traveling across the state of New York um, working with classroom teachers for the last uh, five, six, five to six years. And in that span, I've had the opportunity to work um, with numerous teachers across many districts, BOCES, charter schools, and educational organizations. And so I really see this as a blessing as we think critically and deeply about the ways in which we might be able to implement culturally relevant pedagogy within the classroom. And so with that tonight, what I wanna do is I wanna cover four different items that you see listed here. First, I wanna just quickly revisit uh, culturally relevant pedagogy so then that way um, we have a common language from which to operate. I also wanna introduce to you all uh, New York State Ed's culturally responsive and sustaining framework. This is something that I wanna share with you that you all can have the opportunity to revisit um, at your own leisure. And then I wanna discuss, discuss this work in Beacon and at the end, um, address any questions, comments, or thoughts. Now you should know that what drives my work and in many ways what drives my work, particularly around culturally relevant pedagogy is this question here. How can I, we design instructional practices, curricular activities, and units of study that inspire, engage, and empower our young people. As Mr. Wright had mentioned, part of what's important about this work is in many ways asking our teachers to provide our students with the space to develop tools that help to inspire, engage, and empower them to become democratic citizens um, within our lived realities. And so I share this question with everyone with whom I do work around culturally relevant pedagogy because it really propels people to think, of, think about their own curriculum, instructional practices and units of study and how we might begin to transform them in ways that help to inspire, engage and empower our young people. So with that said, let me go ahead and share with you just a brief history of culturally relevant pedagogy. Now, in all honesty, culturally relevant pedagogy has a very long history. We actually have evidence of it um, being as a way of, of teaching, as a form of teaching, we have evidence that dates back to ancient Egypt. But perhaps most more frequently, um, or more recently, I should say, that culturally relevant pedagogy actually comes from a body of work known as, as asset-based pedagogies. And these came around during the late 1950s, 1960s, as a way for us to begin to rethink how we might engage marginalized students, students of color, students from poor communities, in, um, and, and a system with being successful in schools. Now, depending on when you entered into the teaching profession as a pre-service teacher, it really depends on what framework you were introduced to. So for example, if you came into the teaching profession in the 1980s, 
That is that you did your teacher education development at a school, at a local college during around this time. We might have used the language of multicultural education, right? Then in the mid 1990s, the language shifted to become culturally relevant pedagogy. Um, and then in the 2000s, we see that it's, uh, uh, Geneva Gay came along and talked about this in terms of being culturally responsive teaching. You see this pattern of development of evolution in, in terms of terminology all the way to 2020, where we have some of the most recent work is being highlighted by Goldie Muhammad's recent book, Cultivating Genius, where she talks about using a culturally and historically um, um, responsive literacy framework in which to engage kids. So I wanted to share with you just a little bit of the lineage of this work and to let you know that this work is always evolving, right? As new and exciting ideas around this work begin to emerge, as we begin to think about ways in which we um, tap into our young people's expertise, um, experiences and histories as resources and connect those to our actual classroom practice. Now for tonight's purposes and for my very own, I tend to situate my work along the trajectory of, or I, I, I plant myself firmly in the work of Gloria Latson Billings and her 30 plus career um, working with culturally relevant pedagogy. And so if you look at her work, she talks about culturally relevant pedagogy as, I, as <clears throat> having three tenets. The first is that there is academic achievement, and these are the traditional ways in which we might measure academic success, academic success in classrooms. Um, but then she also talks about this idea of cultural comp competence, where we are leveraging the cultural practices of, our, of the different cultural communities in which our youth are participants. And one thing that's important here to state is that when we talk about cultural competence, it's important that what we do in this instance is that we go deeper than just simply highlighting holidays, festivals, and, um, and activities, or what we oftentimes refer to as the F words when it comes to um, culture, where we focus on fashion, food, fun, and festivals. The other thing that is important here is when we talk about cultural competence and we talk about cultural communities, one of the things that we really want to get away from is simply equating culture to race. This doesn't mean that we don't take race off the table, but what it means is that we recognize that our young people participate in other cultural communities outside of their race. And that really what the goal is, is to think about the complexity or perhaps the intersectionality, the ways in which race, class, gender, religion intersect and operate um, and, and basically shape our young people's worlds. And so it's this more robust understanding of culture um, this more robust understanding of culture that we use to, um, to, to, to implement and think about the second tenet of culturally relevant pedagogy. The last tenet here is this idea of socio-political consciousness. And so this is quite simply increasing the awareness of our young people as to what is going on in their own lived realities. So that way they can redress forms of inequality or inequity. And so if we're seeing culturally relevant pedagogy done well, we're seeing all three of these tenants operate within that learning space. Now, we have plenty of, of examples of what culturally relevant pedagogy should not look like. And oftentimes, it simply just means to introduce books or texts written by people of color um, to students. Culturally relevant pedagogy is much more than that. It is about providing our young people with the tools to be able to transform their worlds into, way, into, into societies in which they believe we can move towards equity. And so for me, the best way to implement this, or I should say a more productive way for me to implement this with teachers is through critical inquiry projects. Now teachers, 
are very familiar with the idea of inquiry projects. And here, when we talk about critical inquiry projects, what we want to do is we want to intentionally blend academic knowledge with critical and social awareness. So then that way our young people develop the skill set to participate in a democratic society. So it's here where we look at the content and we ask ourselves as teachers, as educators, what kinds of investigations could our young people do that centers their lived realities, their social realities, what's going on in their worlds and pairs it with the content knowledge that we, are, um, that we want them to learn. In many ways, performing critical inquiry projects is a way to answer that question that many of our young people have on their minds, which is, when am I ever going to use this, right? This becomes a very concrete way in which we can explain to them, well, this is how you wanna use the knowledge that you're either shaping, the knowledge that you're creating, or the knowledge that you plan to deploy. Now, what's also nice about this framework is that it is well supported by New York State Education's, uh, the New York State Ed Department um, and their culturally responsive and sustaining framework. And they use very similar language to the language that Mr. Wright was using and to the language that I use when I am working with classroom teachers. Now, folks, as I mentioned, you'll have a copy of this document. Um, and so you'll be able to go to the website um, that's listed here at the bottom. But I wanna just take you to the website very quickly. And this is what it looks like um, here for New York State, right? If you go to the side here, you click on view the framework, you will actually be able to download the actual document. And let me see if I could put it into the Zoom group chat. Yeah, that should work. Oops, let me try it this way. <laughs> try to make it, oh, it's not gonna be active, but you can at least um, copy and paste it. And this is what the document looks like. Now, as you read through the document, folks, I know it says 64 pages, but trust me, it's probably more like 15 pages of text and about 40 pages of pictures and images. And so it's actually not as long as it might appear to be. But one of the things that's really nice about this particular text or this particular document is that off to the side, on uh, I believe it's page um, 17. What's nice is um, state ed has basically said that all stakeholders, that is all individuals who are involved in shaping the educational lives of our young people actually have a role in um, implementing and supporting culturally responsive and sustaining education. And so it starts up here with the, uh, with the students. The next tab is teachers. The next tab is school leaders. Then we have district leaders, communities and family, higher education, which is what I uh, represent, and then um, politicians and policy makers. So what's nice about this diffused expertise is that the responsibility for implementing culturally relevant pedagogy within the classroom doesn't simply fall on the shoulder of classroom teachers, but that everyone has a responsibility for ensuring its success. And so here, I've actually pulled out just the teacher's version of the document. But as I mentioned, when you have some time, I would encourage you to take a look at the family and community members portion of this document as a way of thinking about the way, looking at the suggestions that the, um, oh, thank you for that. I really appreciate that. Someone put the link in there. It's, it's active now. Um, and so um, going back to the slide here, the idea here is that there are guidelines that we can use to help inform and support our classroom teachers, our students, are building and district leaders in implementing this work. 
Now, the other thing that I want to um, share with you real quick is <clears throat> that when we talk about culturally relevant pedagogy, that the professional organizations that govern teaching and instruction and curriculum all support culturally relevant pedagogy or these asset-based pedagogies. So it doesn't matter if it's the National Council of Teachers of English or the Association for Career and Technical Education or even the Society of Health and Physical Educators. These national organizations and their New York state, regional and local affiliates all support this work. So now folks, if I can borrow from a metaphor, right? If we have, we're building a four-legged stool. If we know that the research is telling us that this is good, right? State ed is telling us that this is good. And the professional organizations that govern um, instruction in the classroom are telling us that this is good. The fourth leg that would help to stabilize this work would certainly be the district. And this is where Beacon City Schools comes in. Part of what we've been able to do, as uh, Mr. Wright had mentioned, is I've had the opportunity of working with your teachers in, in the past in small groups. I've also had the opportunity to share this information with folks from your leadership teams. And so what we're trying to do is think about how we might be able to more robustly make impact within the school district around culturally relevant pedagogy. Now folks, once again, for us, this is not simply about thinking about substituting one book for another book, right? What we wanna do is we wanna take a look at the books, the content, the topics, the goals, the activities, the questions, the assessments, the resources, materials, the professional development. We want our teachers to have a very robust understanding of what it means to do culturally relevant teaching in the classroom. So that way they walk away knowing that when we do this work and we do this work well, it touches on all aspects that impact um, our students' success in learning. Now, to be upfront with you, this is a lot to try to manage right now especially in a COVID-19 environment where we are figuring, trying to figure out whether we're going face-to-face, -face, hybrid, or remote instruction. I absolutely get that. And so what Mr. Wright and I have talked about, and we've had conversations with your teachers, is we want to be strategic with this rollout. And so in many ways, the way that we see this happening is between January and May, what we want to do is we wanna invite those teachers or re-invite those teachers who are interested in receiving additional support or training in this work. I say invite teachers who, are, who um, want to do this work because what we need to do is we need to generate a coalition of the willing, right? Those teachers who are wanting, desiring, um, looking forward to doing this type of work. So between January and May, what we would like to do is provide those teachers, the coalition of the willing, to spend some time where we do an overview of culturally relevant pedagogy, something that is much more in depth than what we are um, presenting here. But what I'm gonna ask the teachers to do is to change one unit of study, that's it. So what I do in working with classroom teachers to make this a bit more manageable is I ask classroom teachers, listen, let's take one unit of study and let's transform it into an inquiry project. Something where we're gonna blend the content knowledge with helping our young people increase their social awareness of what's going on in their lived realities. And so that way the task doesn't seem too, too, um, too overwhelming. We could just focus on a set of readings. We could focus on a set of activities. We could focus on a set of questions, questions that get our young people to look at their worlds and ask the questions that lead to some type of change. Now, along with this, I do have some recommendations 
if we want to go a little bit further. And we may end up going a little bit further later on in the year. We may carry it over into the summertime. Um, or you may want to move forward on this work as well. I don't know all the details of what's going on in Beacon, but I did share with Mr. Wright that some districts that I've been working with um, have been developing equity, diversity, and inclusion teams made up of teachers, administrators, parents, and community members where they're tackling these ideas. Many of them are also reviewing uh, the New York State Ed uh, framework and thinking about ways in which they can implement the different guidelines, even organizing professional development opportunities around those guidelines. Another way to engage in this work is to perform um, an EDI audit of district policies and practices as a way to uncover any kinds of unconscious bias. And then of course, we can always simply do a book study where I've selected four books that, are le um, that you see here to the right of your screen that help us to begin to think about this work in more depth. And so we're really excited about the possibility. I have lots of ideas that even Mr. Wright, I've had the opportunity of sharing with Mr. Wright and um, have lots of ideas and ways in which we can go about doing this work a bit systematically. I even shared with him the fact that I spend a lot of time, even though I'm here in Buffalo, I spend a lot of time in the, um, in the Mid Hudson Valley. And so the idea of maybe um, partnering when I come down to the region, maybe letting him know I'm in the area so then that way I can work with the teachers um, in a bit more intimate session, uh, intimate fashion when we're able to do that, right? There are a number of different ways in which we are able to move this forward, implement it and support our teachers along the way. And so with that said, I wanna thank you all for the opportunity to speak with you. And if anyone has any questions, comments, or thoughts, I'd be more than happy to answer them at this time. Go ahead, Anthony. Uh, who performs the EDI audit? Well, there are a number of organizations that actually um, can do that. Um, I believe the Metro Center at NYU has a document that, um, that you can use to help perform your own um, EDI work. And that's something that I can point you in the direction of. Um, there's another organization called MEAC. Um, is it the Mid-Atlantic Educational Consortium, I believe, that has, um, has that. But one of the things, I'm currently working with the district right now where we're actually developing our own auditing tool, right? as a way of looking at the curriculum to ask those hard questions about the curriculum. Part of those questions, those hard questions would be, um, who's represented in our curriculum and how are they represented? Because it's not just simply about bringing in people of color into the curriculum, but it's also about how they're being represented. So are they positioned in a way where um, they're seen helpless, um, that they seem um, afraid, that they, they seem to be powerless, or, or are there ways in which are our communities being represented in a way where resiliency is being shown, where persistence is being shown, and even to a certain degree, um, agency, being able to be empowered with what they have. So, it all, so there are a number of different audits um, that you can use. Some places, right, will be definitely more expensive than others. Um, but I think with the right guidance, you can also draw upon what people have done in the past if this is a direction that you wanna try to test out um, and develop your own auditing tool. Um, as I mentioned, um, NYU's Metro Center, that's a free tool that you can, you can find online. I'll share it with you momentarily. Um, but I really like the idea of building um, our own tool simply because um, it, it is done in a way where uh, if the people are involved in developing the tool, then we're able to, to answer the kinds of questions that are specific um, to that district. In this case, it would be um, Beacon. There are a couple of questions in the chat, Javon. I don't know if you can see them. 
let me see. Do you think 25 million provided by the state for this framework is enough? I know that it, it has been a topic of discussion in the community and we'll love to hear your opinion. Um, you know, quite honestly, I don't know if that's enough. It sounds like a very small um, portion to me um, for this type of work, especially if we're talking about districts across the state of New York. Um, it's a lot of districts and I don't think that 25 million is going to go as far, but perhaps this becomes an opportunity, um, maybe some seed money to see how some school districts are able to implement this work uh, a bit more effectively. You know, one of the things that is um, highly problematic is that we tend to think about culturally relevant pedagogy as just something for children of color, um, as if our, um, our white students don't need access to this information. But I actually argue that our white students are actually um, equally need this information as well um, as a way, so then that way they um, grow up understanding that we live in a pluralistic society where uh, people of color have historically been engaged in their own um, um, agency towards human development. So, so the short question to that, uh, to that is, I don't think that 25 million is enough uh, for the framework. And, um, but you know, it gets us going. Um, I have a, a comment here. This work operates on the assumption that teachers have a deep understanding of their identity and culture and that they are curious and actively seeking out understanding of other cultures and take on a learning stance. How do you ensure that teachers, especially white teachers, are able to facilitate this type of learning and minimize harm in the process? I think that's a good question, right? Um, because the part of the way in which I'm entering into this conversation with the board right now is through uh, looking at curriculum and instruction. But there are also two other areas in which this work has to be um, looked at as well. One is the institutional level. So taking a look at the institutional practices and policies that are in place that perhaps appear to be race neutral, but in fact have highly racialized outcomes. One example of that um, is oftentimes in schools that we see is our discipline. Um, there's oftentimes a disproportionate um, level of discipline applied um, to students based on race, even though we might think of those uh, policies as being race neutral. The other place that we look at, we need to look at that institutionally is hiring practices. This is what it helps to explain or contribute to the explanation of a teaching force that um, is 85% um, white. Um, but the other area of that is dispositions, right? So this becomes about the dispositions of certain teachers, that there are just some teachers who are not interested in doing that deep understanding of their own identity and culture, right? Um, I've met those teachers. I assume by asking this particular question that, that the, the person who's asking this question may have met those um, types of teachers as well. And so one of the things that Mr. Wright and I will continue to talk about is while we're gonna work with the coalition of the willing here, once we get that settled, what we wanna start doing um, is start working with to begin to do that self-examination of themselves, right? Um, particularly of white teachers to think about um, how to organize learning in ways where we don't do uh, what's known as in the literature as political violence, right? Where we don't engage in unintentional um, forms of harm on our children. And this is all a process. Part of this is just getting us into that conversation. But if I had to make a recommendation, if you wanted to jumpstart that conversation with your faculty, you certainly could look at them. I'm, I'm searching around right now. I thought I had the book on my table here. Um, but it must be near my recliner. Um, Courageous Conversations About Race by Glenn Singleton. In that text, um, Glenn Singleton does a very good job of talking about having teachers, white teachers in particular, begin the process of doing a self-examination where they begin to see themselves as racialized beings 
and then move towards the process of creating learning, um, learning routines, practices, opportunities that don't, um, that are highly reflective and don't engage in that unintentional harm. So that's how I would answer that, uh, that question. I have another question here, even though this pedagogy is continuing to evolve, how can we get a sense on how long and how much ground we need to cover in order to fully implement this program? I think this is something where we're gonna have to sit down and speak very honestly and candidly about the resources that are available to us and the types of um, access um, and work we want our teachers to be able to do. Um, in an ideal world, quite honestly, doing culturally responsive teaching is ongoing, right? So it doesn't have like an, an end date, right? What we want to do is we want to um, inter integrate this into the culture of Beacon. So then that way it becomes part of the cultural routine of the things that we do. Um, and so, and that we're always moving or evolving in a way um, where we continue to think more deeply about ways in which we can serve our students and serve our communities. So how long, um, quite honestly, I, this is part of what we're talking about here is we're talking about changing the culture um, or contributing to changing the culture in the ways in which teaching and learning take place in, 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 Beacon, in Beacon. And so, um, and so how much ground do we need to cover? We need to be strategic, right? Part of what I'm hoping that you're hearing in this conversation is we're not going in like gangbusters and everybody has to do this, right? What we wanna do is we wanna be a bit more strategic with this development. And that's why I've been using the language of the coalition of the willing, right? Let's work with those classroom teachers who are interested in doing this work. Let's start taking a look at um, um, classroom practices. Let's take a look at the curriculum and instructional units. If you already have some type of equity team, maybe we can begin to have conversations with the equity team. So then that way they can start working on bringing in families and communities. We can um, talk about um, bringing in what that audit might look like, right? So that way this becomes a multi-pronged approach. Let's see here. Yeah, I know this is a huge passion of Antony's. I just wanna see if there are any other board members um, that have questions just before you get to Anthony's next question. Go ahead, Kristen. Sure. No problem. Um, so I had two questions. Um, well, one, a couple of parts. One is um, even looking at the critical in inquiry process, the idea of having student-led uh, learning, that feels like a first sort of leap in terms of vulnerability and losing kind of control over, uh, over how things go. Um, my assumption is then especially in a diverse community, that student generated, you know, that process of it being co-created with the students would, would lead to sort of more cultural engagement and sort of uncovering of that, that would sort of almost cause the creation of that framework to be forced into place in a diverse community. Um, we had, we've started, as you know, we, the, you've been working with us for a little bit, um, and done some projects here. But I think my question as a board member is, we enshrined this as an we enshrined these goals, these equity goals, and we've been sort of intentionally going through and looking at discipline and uh, looking at practice a little bit um, or, you know, a lot. Uh, but a lot of this was happening before it sort of exploded into this very um, prominent conversation. And so, now it was it wasn't easier, but we could put the funding in. We could have the goal. We could be doing the work in that coalition of the willing way, um, without it feeling sort of forced or having this intense focus on it. What do you recommend from a leadership standpoint, from the seats we're in, that we can do to sort of continue to help protect this work so that it moves forward? Is there a best practice or something that boards do or? Do we participate in the book study if it's done? Anything like that? Yeah. So I think going to the framework and looking at families and community, 
you're going to see some guidelines of some concrete things that you might be able to do to help support as a board to help support um, classroom teachers, students, family members, things like that. Um, I think that clearly um, engaging in book studies um, as a board, as a large community um, would certainly be uh, productive, right? But I think that as a board, um, think about where your power lies and how you might be able to leverage that power to help support, um, support the students. And I think that might be the best way um, to accomplish this, right? So if we're talking about changing the culture here, like one of the things that I, um, I certainly advocate for is that when we do, and you mentioned the critical inquiry projects, when we do the critical inquiry projects, what I actually um, suggest in working with, um, with other school districts and even with BOCES is what we need to have is we need to have some kind of youth conference where students can come together and share their expertise in a manner or, or share and exchange their expertise, excuse me, with each other across grade levels. So then that way they see that they are not the only ones who are engaged in this work, all right? And so there I would think that, you know, the question then becomes, so then how could, how could our board help support our young people in doing this type of work? One of the things that I will oftentimes talk about with um, classroom teachers, and I think that Mr. Wright has heard, heard me talk about this as well, is I really advocate our young people going to teacher professional development um, conferences and showcasing their work, right? The idea quite simply is when we talk about teaching practices for young people, let's put the young people, let's give our young people the opportunity to talk about that. Now, you know, it would be beautiful like the conference that we did, I showed you the image of some of the young people Right, that was a conference that took place at Marist College two years ago, right? Where they came together to share their work. And so this was, you know, first grade all the way up to 12th grade. But just, and it involved districts from around your region, um, those districts who participated in Duchess Boses. But if we had to do this at a district level, what we may wanna do is begin to think about how this type of work can be a type of rites of passage for high school students, right? Where maybe similar to students going away to uh, a senior trip or um, maybe participating in a competition, maybe part of what they do is they display their work at teacher conferences. And what we end up doing is we end up creating students who can talk about teaching and learning about themselves. And so, so in answer to your question, right, how then can the board support that, right? Maybe it's initiatives, right? Maybe it's grant proposals, maybe it's access to um, deadlines of funding, right? Being thoughtful about the, the distribution of the funding. But in addition to that, right, I also think about how can we support our, our teachers? So I actually, as I talk about a youth conference, I also talk about a teacher conference of best practices. And so once again, how can the board go about supporting those teachers where they're sharing their practices, um, not only with their colleagues within Beacon schools, right? But in many ways, how can Beacon become that space where when people say, if you really wanna see culturally relevant teaching done well, you gotta go to Beacon, right? because they're doing it and they're doing it well. Where the idea here is, you know, Duchess Boses is no longer contacting me, right? It's like, let's just go to Beacon. Let's invite some of their teachers. Let's teach this out, right? The goal is to try to figure out how we can be, self-supported, right? How we can be um, self-generating. Um, how we can build capacity within our own district. So then that way, it's just once again, part of the culture, right? 
Now, there are other things that, you know, other recommendations that I have, but part of this would, I would have to ask quite honestly, um, and I don't mean this with any, any kind of um, cynicism, but you tell me what you can do, right? Let's ask the teachers what the board can do, right? Let's look at what other boards have been able to do to support um, faculty, students, and families towards these particular goals. Did I answer your question? I know it was a pretty long-winded response. <laughs> no, I mean, it actually, I just started to put in the chat that it's, this actually sounds very, almost identical in terms of language um, to sustainability work. Yeah. It's actually the same focus about building agency and understanding just about affecting your environment as opposed to learning about yourself. Yeah. One is belong is the world you belong to and the other is belonging to yourself, it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. And and so, yeah, you know, and so the idea, once again, right, like we would have to answer those kinds of questions. Um, and we we can, and if we have time, we can look at what other boards have done to support um the different um communities right there's stakeholders as the state would say um in this type of work i, I think one of the one of the good things that we have we had started doing uh over the last year and a half is we started with some work with uh with the core collaborative dignity framework where it talked about creating a sense of belonging and so i think that work was instrumental in getting us to this point right here where we have this understanding of what's needed in terms of creating that sense of belonging and then which this work really represents is how you go about creating that sense of belonging you know what are some steps you can take and so um putting this together along with that i think will really help us to start uh will continue to build that rapport with students to learn about their background and now the next step bringing that those backgrounds into this work, you know, uh, and empowering them to move forward, to uh, to, to talk about how uh, they could um, really affect change, you know, in the communities and how they can affect change in terms of things that they see that's happening within their uh, within within their groups. If I may, if I may, Mr. Wright, there's a question in here. Where in this path? I like to respond to where in this path of changing the culture would changing the textbooks be done? I think that's a collaborative question that we would have to ask um, collectively, right? And that's not me sidestepping the question, but um, in my work with teachers, I've worked with teachers who hold on with dear life <laughs> to certain books, right? And they're not ready. And I've worked with teachers who have said, just give me the word, Javon, and I've already got the next book lined up. <laughs> so in many ways, we have to get a sense of, to answer that question, we have to get a sense of where the teachers are as a, as a department um, to make those kinds of changes. But I will admit that um, the model that I've been using, um, that I've been talking about is, Let's just focus on one unit of study at a time. One unit of study. Let's do one unit of study and let's see what happens. Because what ultimately will happen is student engagement will look differently. Teachers will begin to um, relinquish some of the power in the classroom, right? Um, and then they'll be prepared to try it on another unit of study. Right, and then this also depends on disciplines. So part of what uh, Mr. Wright and I have been talking about right now is let's let's work with the part of the coalition of the willing right now is coming from the as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Wright, but the ELA teachers um, and the social studies teachers. Yes. So let's work with them at the secondary level. Let's work with them, and um, let's start working through this process. We'll change the book. Um, next year, we'll talk about maybe in the summertime, where can we make us, where can we substitute a text and substitute what for it, right? That's where we would do it. So then that way it's not done um, top down, but it's done more um, um, from, from the perspective of the classroom teachers. 
bit more grassroots in its development. Thank you. Any other questions, comments, thoughts? This is so great, and it and it feels like it fits in with the work we've been doing for the past couple of years with various professional development. We've also talked about um, doing a curriculum review. Um, that, but it's 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 nice to hear what you're saying that this is this is very personal work, and obviously our teachers care a lot, and we have to. Um, we have to find, you know, ways to make them feel comfortable with it and, and some, the pace will not be the same for everyone. And that's not, that's not a bad thing. I think that's, that's letting, you know, that's letting the work happen in a good way. Um, we actually have on our agenda tonight, a, a letter of um, support for the CRS framework bill. Um, so we're, we've been reading about that and, and um, it feels like it goes very well with with the work we've been doing. So um, I feel really lucky that we're working with you. Thank you. And, and um, I hope that we can hear an update maybe when in June when things are looking like whatever normal is going to look like. Hey, we, uh, got a vaccine, we got a vaccine on the horizon, right? Yes. Yeah. I'm staying optimistic. I'm staying exactly. optimistic. I tell my kids, we're back in school in, um, <laughs> in September. It's yeah. happening. So yeah. exactly, exactly. And I think it'll be um, it's hard to get our heads around, you know, what that will be like because everything feels so nutty right now. But absolutely. Folks, I want to let you know I just put in the Zoom group chat the scorecard by the Metro Center. Um, once again, this is um, a, an auditing tool that I've introduced to um, some school districts. Some school districts are using it. Um, some school districts are using it to build their own. Um, so definitely if this is something, you know, if you have some time in our busy lives, I right, take a look at it, um, as a potential document. Okay. And, um, if folks have any other questions, comments, or thoughts, uh, please, this is my email address. I'll, uh, type it in, in the zoom group chat. And of course, Mr. Wright knows how to get a hold of me. Um, I'd be more than happy to respond to any questions or comments even after the fact. Thank you so much. Are, are there any other last questions for John before we move on? And Eric, thank you also very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, moving on to executive session. Can I have a motion to adjourn to executive session to review the employment history of a particular individual to review the proposed acquisition sale or lease of real property? Only one, pub, uh, only one publicity would substantially affect the value thereof and to seek legal advice from the school attorney. So moved. Anthony. Second. Anthony. Are there any comments or questions about that? Just uh, to to board members, it's the uh, it's the Google Meet link that I sent out. Um, I forget when I sent it out earlier today. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Everyone's here now, right? So we're nine to zero passes. Okay, we should be back. It's probably gonna be a half hour, 45 minutes to the public. Thank you. Reviewing the agenda, we're gonna remove a couple of items from it. 11.5 um, F9 will be removed and 11.19 will be removed. Do we have any student or school presentations tonight? Or parent groups? Okay, seeing none, Matt, do you want to give you a report? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, Mike, if, if you could put those slides up, please. Um, and you can flip to the first slide. 
Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to just, uh, in some of this, <laughs> I need a little change, but I wanted to just take a moment to uh, update the board um, on some, on some, uh, on some actions that we are exploring or, and or preparing for. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, there's, you know, with the rising case rates, uh, res rising positive test case rates, um, there's been a, a sort of a, a growing or heightened uh, amount of concern um, with uh, um, with our, you know, uh, reopening or staying open. And so I, I took a moment, uh, took a few moments last week. I did a town hall with staff and I did a town hall with, uh, with the community just to talk about um, at least my knowledge up to that point of the yellow, orange, and red microcluster zones, uh, what testing might look like if we were required to test, and then, uh, and then talking about the possibility of us testing even before we be get into one of those zones. Um, so I have a, a little bit more, and uh, I've learned a little bit more since I did those last week on Wednesday. Um, and, uh, and of course, I saw, I guess the governor released uh, his new metrics on Friday uh, for the yellow, orange, and red. I, I get them sort of sent to me um, by uh, different organizations, and I, I didn't see uh, the new metrics until a little bit before the board meeting. So he gets more specific about what the hospitalization rates mean. But essentially, uh, the yellow, orange, and red, we all see that the case rates in the region are, are rising into the, or the positive test rates are rising into the five and 6% range. Um, and so that immediately gets people thinking about uh, whether we're in one of these zones. And uh, these zones are, are not based on a county or a region, they're really based on a zip code or census tract, A. Um, and, and they, we, we can see the county data, we can see the regional data, but we don't have the data, um, at least in that sort of numeric way, boiled down to us. So that's at the governor's level. And he talked about a week ago about, because uh, he hasn't announced new zones in, in I think, two weeks. And he talked uh, uh, last, last week about adding hospitalization rates, and he has made that formal. So now hospitalization rates are part of the yellow, orange, and red. So I don't know if that means we're gonna be seeing less of these zones because of, uh, of the hospitalization rates or we'll be seeing more. Uh, I think we thought he was going to announce or we heard he was gonna announce more of these zones today and he did not, at least to the best of my knowledge, he did not. Uh, but I've attended a, a number of sessions about this uh, the last week and a half. And it seems like the main, um, the main thing about this is it's best to really prepare uh, your community and district for the possibility of being in one of these zones. Um, as we started to prepare uh, for this, we realized that there's a possibility uh, that we also start uh, a testing program on our own. So I just wanted to talk about that possibility because that's what it is uh, at this point. You can hit the next slide. So if, if we do get labeled in one of these zones, from what I understand, uh, you're told 48 hours before it becomes official. So you have a couple of days, um, you have a couple of days to kind of communicate and prepare. Um, but there's there's kind of a big shift in this, and the shift has happened over the last week or two. The emphasis uh, in the shift has been on keeping schools open. Um, so a few weeks ago, the orange and red used to be you had to test 100% of your in-person people, which is a very very difficult task, if not impossible. So they've definitely changed that. Yellow has stayed the same. Um, but I think the first rounds of these across the state, they saw some districts just close right away. Um, and I think they're, they're not really seeing um, the benefit in that. Uh, I think folks are seeing the importance of keeping things open um, statewide, uh, despite the rising case rates, they're seeing very little transmission of the virus in schools. Um, I think that's because in New York, uh, the plans have been taken very seriously. Uh, including beacon with mask wearing and and uh, social distancing and reducing class size probably being the main uh, drivers of that lack of transmission. But anyway, if we become a yellow zone, we need to test 20% of our in-person people over two weeks. 
Um, if those results are lower, have a lower positive test rate than the zone's current rate, we don't need to do any more testing and we just kind of keep on doing what we're doing. Um, if we're orange or red, um, we have to test uh, over a month of time. Orange is 20% of your in-person over a month. Red is 30% uh, of your in-person um, over a month's time. And on the next slide, it's a little bit about what that means, although I'm still kind of learning about this too. Uh, so you can hit the next slide. Uh, so for orange and red, um, my understanding of this, and I, I attended a thing today, which I helped explain this to me a little bit more. Uh, so if we're ever testing, um, if we're testing orange or red, we're essentially testing uh, 10 to 15 percent of the time um, because you have to do it in two week increments. Um, and so uh, the whole thing about rates is only if you're doing 300 tests or more uh, due to beacon size and the number of people we have in person we will probably never be testing uh, that many people at once. Uh, so my understanding, uh, I mean, I took this language straight from it, but I think there's more to learn about it. Uh, if, if this random testing we did, if we were orange or red generates nine or more positive cases in any school. So that would be what applies to us, nine or more positive cases in any of our individual schools, not, not wholly, but in our individual schools. Um, the reason the rate thing doesn't apply to us is I don't think we would ever do 300 tests at a time. In fact, I'm pretty sure we would not do 300 tests at a time um, if we did test. Next slide. So I just wanna talk about what this testing would be if we become one of these zones and again, um, I think preparing for this is important. Uh, I've noticed just sort of watching the trends that um, a lot of districts that are put into these zones are city, small city school districts um, for whatever reason. Um, and, you know, in this region, we are seeing case rates go up. So I think it's a possibility, although that is just purely my opinion. I do not have any advanced information or anything. Um, so the testing is basically what folks call surveillance testing. Um, and it would be done um, with, the, uh, with the rapid nasal swab tests. Uh, so uh, a number of districts have gone through this process, have attended different sort of webinars or Zoom sessions with uh, superintendents from these districts. And, uh, and you know, it's very clear that the tests you get from the state are not the PCR tests, they're just the rapid, um, really quick nasal swabs, uh, not painful, uh, done really quickly that you get the results 10 minutes later. Um, and that the schools have testing sites set up where they can do that um, and have uh, and, and get the results uh, to families uh, 10 or 15 minutes later. Uh, you do need to gather consent forms for students. So one of the things I learned from these sessions is just in preparation for this, you start gathering um, consent. Um, and so we're we have some things to kind of tighten up. Uh, with our consent form, but our hope is that we um, put that out in the next coming days um, so we can start um, gathering consent just to prepare for this. Uh, and that you're just testing samples of your uh, of your in-person population, and that is both students and staff. Uh, you're not testing everyone all at once. Um, and you, you take those consents that you gather and you try to uh, do a random approach to it. Um, so, why are we thinking about possibly testing before we even become a zone? Um, because we have learned, uh, and we learned this about a week ago, that we can actually get these state tests before we even become a zone. Uh, the, there's no charge for these to the district. The state has some sort of major supply chain on this, um, and they make them available for districts that, that, uh, that ask for them. Uh, so we have put in an application. A couple of the districts in Dutchess have done this as well. Uh, sort of either to prepare for being yellow, orange, or red, or to uh, think about or prepare for doing a testing program um, before we even get labeled. So, uh, so some of my thinking behind at least thinking about that and planning for that is uh, is just it. I said in the town halls last week, it's a it's another uh, level of safety and security that we can provide. It'd be uh, identifying obviously uh, asymptomatic uh, people who are testing positive, um, getting them out of the in-school population and into a quarantine uh, sort of situation. So even to minimize even further any chance to spread um, of the virus in the district or, or honestly in the community. Um, 
So that being said, and you can hit the next slide. Um, so some of the next steps, uh, some of these involve a little bit more work. Uh, securing tests from the state is just an application uh, that we put in. And, uh, and I, from my understanding, they, they told us yes. And I think they're telling any district that's interested, yes. And they're setting up shipments of the tests. Part where it gets a little trickier um, is setting, setting up an agreement with the county uh, that we would operate under their lab license. Um, the county, Dutchess County, has been great in trying to work with districts. We have a weekly uh, Zoom call. Um, all the superintendents and Dutchess and their staffs do with a, with a large number of Department of Health staff. We started the last couple weeks working on this issue, um, but we just uh, received a, a draft uh, MOU from Dutchess County um, Friday evening. Uh, so we have to pour over that uh, and sort of work out some issues with that. And that may take a little bit more time than I estimated before. Um, collecting consent forms, we can do that electronically and we can do that fairly easily. And then there's just sort of the uh, logistical side that we would need to develop and the educational side. And, and educating is possibly making videos to show what it looks like, really uh, informing you know parents who consent to this that um, that it's part of us just trying to surveil spread uh, of the virus uh, in the community and in the school district and just it being another sort of level of safety and security for the district too. So um, I'm still optimistic. I'm certainly optimistic. Uh, I think we will be just with the work we've already done. I think we'll be very ready um, if we become a yellow, orange or red zone um, over winter break or right after winter break or sometime in January. Um, we have discussed with our nursing staff um, uh, that they would be administering the tests uh, and they're uh, willing and able to do that um, with some guidance um, from uh, Dutchess County Health Department. Um, setting up the agreement, like I said, um, becomes a little bit, uh, it, it's just becomes a little bit more complex. It's a complex thing we're trying to pull off and there's assurances that we need from the county and assurances they need from us and we need more time to work that out. That obviously being an MOU would need to be approved by the board as well. And so that MOU would cover us uh, if we were yellow, orange, or red, or if we wanted to start testing even before, um, even before we become one of those zones. So um, we don't have you know, a, a formal board meeting until January. Um, I think January 11th is the next meeting. Um, with us being um, more Zoom, we can certainly try to call a special board meeting, although I know that's difficult during winter break and holidays and whatnot. Uh, if we wanted to try to approve the MO, MOU, um, certainly I would advise that we do that if, um, if we became a zone, you know, to do that as quickly as possible so we can start testing as quickly as possible. Um, but I still do really, I, I'm still really committed to exploring um, and trying to plan for a testing program, even if we're not in the zone. Um, the reason I say that is I think just, uh, it's like I said, it's another level of safety and security. Um, it's also just another le level of uh, us taking this uh, as seriously as we have. Um, but that being said, there's things to work out. Uh, and there's a lot of things that we're still working on and in the midst of a very busy time of year. So we're doing our best to try to get some of this done. So I wanted to bring this to the board, open it up for questions. If you have any, uh, it's still obviously a huge work in progress. We are nowhere near uh, ready to start, you know, doing any sort of testing and it would require uh, board approval of an MOU between us and Dutchess County anyway, um, which is not even close to being ready for tonight, uh, tonight's board meeting. So that all being said, um, it's something that we are preparing for. If we're in a zone, we're also preparing for a testing program, um, even if we're not a zone. Um, I think uh, us trying to find ways to stay open and stay safe in these winter months uh, is important. So we have explored this pretty aggressively and have tried, um, tried to be as prepared as possible. Um, so I want to just take my superintendent update tonight just to update you on this. Uh, I updated the community last week. I wanted to take a moment at the board meeting to do that and open up for questions. So Matt, I just had a question um, yeah. with the testing piece. And I think it's great that the district is doing whatever, whatever we possibly can do to have kids attend in person. I, I know that there's a lot of barriers in place. 
One other thing with the testing, I'm, I'm seeing that some districts aren't getting the 20% uh, consent from the, um, from the um, parents and stuff for the testing. Would it be possible to like have our nurses trained so they feel like, because that's someone they know and they might feel more comfortable having them administer the test instead of like um, an outside person and then they have the option to get it from the outside if they want? Yeah, um, we, that, that's our plan to uh, to work with the nurses for our, our nursing staff to do it. Another thing that we thought about if we do if we do the testing is, uh, you know, I've I've kind of analyzed uh, some different districts and the way they've done it, and maybe this also comes from me being an elementary parent as well. Uh, but I know a lot of elementary parents would be uh, really hesitant, I think, to have their kids tested without them being either nearby or, you know, present in some way. So some districts uh, either delayed the start of school or went all remote for a day to test as many kids as possible, almost in kind of like drive-through clinics or walk-up clinics, um, excuse me, so parents could be with kids and you would get uh, you would get the result right away as a family from the test, waiting, waiting in uh, cars for the most part. Uh, and, uh, and then, you know, if there is a positive that, uh, the person, either staff member, um, or student can isolate, uh, go back to like their house and, and quarantine without having to, you know, spend time in a classroom. Uh, some districts just pull kids out of class, uh, K through 12 and, and give them the test. And I, and I know that's probably an efficient way to do it. I just, I'm not certain that's the most child-friendly way to do it. Um, so I think, I think you know, we, and that's the reason why we're, A, we're working on the consent form uh, with both the health department and legal, but B, we, if we send a consent form out in the next few days, we want to have at least some educational materials with it so people understand what the process would be, and we want parents to feel both educated and empowered about it, and not just like this is something done to their kid. I think I think as a dad, I would worry about my son being like pulled out of class, he gets tested and then they find out it's a positive result and he's has to go like, you know, uh, in the isolation room and he may not totally understand what this is all about. Um, and I think probably most parents feel that way. So we wanted to set up a process that's pretty family friendly. Um, and, and it's just trying to learn from other districts. Uh, some of the districts in Westchester that did this uh, that I've spoken with or attended sessions with, they did either like the remote for a day or like a delayed start to try to test as many kids with their parents as they could to get both the numbers and also, you know, to have that communication part with parents be very personal and in the moment. But those are good questions. And I know it's a struggle to get people to sign up. Matt, you, you touched upon it just a little bit. Um, I was going to ask, are we um, looking at do, do you think we need additional counseling um, uh, offerings as well with this? Um, can, you, can, would it, could you say what you mean? Can, like what kind of counseling? Like uh, um, the, the social workers, you know, just to, because, you know, it could be, um, there's, 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 there's definitely a, quite a few emotions that can happen with the testing and what the results may be. Right, right. Um, we certainly could uh, develop something uh, to support kids with that. Um, I think I think that's the thinking. Part of that is the thinking behind parents being involved and bringing their students to a test, like either a drive up or a walk up, that the parent can be there to kind of talk with their kids. But I think I think developing maybe some you know talking points and maybe talking with classes about it too. Um, that it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, cause I, it's, uh, the, the fear and anxiety factor is real for everyone. It's real for our staff. It's real for our students for sure. Um, and I think that's a great point to try to really make this feel comfortable and safe for people. Um, I don't know Anthony, Anthony exactly what that would look like. And so I'd have to look into that a little bit more and talk to what other, to see what other districts have done around that. Thank you. I just want to uh, say thank you, Matt, for putting this together and for um, actually for updating the community first before, instead of waiting for a board meeting to unveil it and then talk to the community, because um, I couldn't attend last week, but I really appreciate you sharing the presentation and the fact that it was happening and the, um, 
just kind of seeing that there was some engagement around it. And I'm sure this will, like you said, need to be communicated or repeated, but hopefully we're able to share um, as broadly as possible to Anthony's point that this is what's going to allow us to stay open and to um, do so safely with more visibility of what we're dealing with in terms of uh, where the virus is in our um, community. And it's, I just really appreciate you being very proactive and once again, kind of looking towards uh, what we can do. Yeah, thank you. Um, no, it's, it's uh, um, I think my message is slightly different today than it was on Wednesday. And I, I, and this is not a criticism at all of Dutchess County. So I want to be clear about that. I, I don't think I realized how complex the MOU would be. And so I just, I, it made me realize that it's that the MOU is going to take a little bit of time. Um, and it, it was, it was, uh, it was kind of empowering to hear other superintendents talk about this, uh, this process in their, um, in their districts. So at the very least, we're really prepared if we're a zone. Uh, but as Anne Marie and Hannah and I were talking, we've been talking about this for about three or four weeks now. Uh, Hannah Akhtar, head nurse, and and um, it kind of started to dawn on us that uh, maybe we shouldn't wait for a zone. So I a zone designation. So I'm still really committed uh, to trying to figure that out, um, and I, I think it's very very doable. Um, there's just some pieces that might take a little bit longer. Um, and then the formal board approval of it too. And there's a lot of communication, more communication that needs to happen. Um, but I, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's also nice that the state is willing to provide these for us. Um, you know, I, I think one of the other things we need to figure out is, uh, I need to both kind of communicate with the state and the county, but also the community about results and how we publicize them and, you know, and, 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 and what happens if we get certain numbers, uh, especially if we're doing it just voluntarily because it's unclear <laughs> uh, if we're not a zone, what we do with the results. So, uh, so that's something that we'd still need to work out as well. Um, but we're spending a lot of time on this and uh, I, I just want to quickly give a shout out to you while I'm on it to our, just our nursing staff as a whole. Um, they have been, you know, I mean, our all of our staff, our and teachers have been amazing uh, during this, but our nursing staff has been has been truly amazing, just taking on a lot of new challenges this year, and uh, and just embracing all of them. So I just want to give them a little shout out because they've been amazing this year, and I'm excited that they're interested in doing this too. Are there any other questions for Matt? Um, okay. So just in terms of next steps, uh, Dan Pettigrew, one of our attorneys, uh, we're going to work on the MOU with Dutchess County. And then if we kind of establish one that we all feel good about, then I'll speak with the board officers about the best way to move it forward with the board. Meanwhile, we'll work on the consent form and the education piece, uh, and we'll develop kind of two plans. One would be a foreign zone and one would be like pre-zone <laughs> uh, testing and we want to be able to do both. Um, so, um, so, so that's just our next steps with that. And that's, that's all I have uh, for the superintendent's report, except just also a huge thank you. I know he's not on anymore, but to John Hunter and Eric Wright for the presentation earlier. Um, I enjoyed listening uh, and and letting you know other people who are really brilliant at this work speak about it, but it's really exciting uh, to see this moving forward. And uh, and I thank the board for their support of this work. And that's it. Thanks. Um, we're just trying to. Jasmine's having trouble getting back onto the call, so I think um, hopefully. I don't know. Hopefully that changing host is going to fix that. Um, in the meantime, we have our committee reports and board comments. Um, Anthony White, do you want to start? Sure. The curriculum committee has not met since our last board meeting. Um, the December one was canceled. 
due to the work uh, that the um, that Eric and uh, the district has to do with the TSI um, to get that um, ready for the January uh, implementation date. Um, and I believe that will get, does that get board approved, Eric, as well? Yes. Yeah. We're doing that will to the January 11th. January 11th board meeting, the, the TSI uh, uh, seat plan. Um, comments, I'm just happy that, you know, um, Dr. Landall is looking to maintain uh, in-person instruction as best as possible. I think the systems are set up to give the way not to be in person um, if districts don't want to do that work, but I'm happy that he's taking on that work. No other comments. Thanks. Um, Kristen? Thanks. Uh, I'll just, for facilities, our next meeting is Thursday, December 17th at 6 p.m. I apologize to uh, fellow board members. I did not get my summary notes out from the last meeting, so I will do that. Um, I'm going to provide an overview right now, but um, greater detail in that um, summary. Uh, what we talked about was when working backwards from when we would have a vote on the facilities um, on, on the capital project. Uh, we had three options, one being in the summer, one being in October, and the other in December, all of 2021, um, or one being in May, sorry, I apologize. Um, the other October, the other December of 2021. Uh, we've landed on thinking pursuing an October vote would be the best strategy because um, that would give us time if it were rejected to go back to the voters after adjusting the plan, but with obviously the hope of it passing. Um, this would mean work on that project would begin in the summer of 2022. Uh, the, we discussed um, how, to, uh, how to go about community engagement and communication. One of the suggestions was building level committees. Uh, then we talked about publicizing the project, getting feedback and going out to the broader community. Um, the next meeting we're going to find out, um, for, we're going to receive a report from our financial advisor as to uh, where each building is uh, with regard to its maximum aid cap. This lets us know how much we can do in each building. Um, also, we didn't receive the full report, but we received preliminary findings of the Buildings and Condition Survey. Uh, the news there is that a significant portion of this project, um, project's finances will, will need to be dedicated to bringing buildings and systems up to date within the district. This means that with the remaining money, we're going to need to be very strategic about how we, um, how we do uh, work that will be impactful on students and education and have kind of um, at least some generate some excitement within the community. I, I feel like it's too early to even float some of the ideas that we discussed there because the, it was kind of more of a brainstorming session within an internal meeting and in no way reflects um, community uh, input. But one thing we do know based on um, prior experience is that we really need to align not just ideas people have, but what our capacity is, what our staff wants, where we can really have the most impact and how we can maximize um, the money that we have to use that. So um, there is also, uh, we reviewed images of the bleachers having been put in at the turf field. And as I said, our next meeting will be on Thursday at 6 p.m. We're going to get the financial report again, uh, get some more information about the buildings and condition survey. And I believe that's it. Uh, thank you again to Matt for all of the uh, hard work you're doing to keep us open. And um, I really enjoyed the presentation tonight from Dr. Hunter. And I hope that we can have more presentations like this where the partners that we're working with um, can, can come and present to us. So it's a great window into the work as well. Thanks, um, Anthony. Uh, good evening. Um, I uh, also uh, I'm, I uh, I enjoyed the uh, presentation from Dr. Hunter as well and, and Mr. Wright. Um, 
and I look forward to hearing more um, of that project as it continues. Um, I know it's 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 hard to um, to continue extra projects in this environment, but I think it's good work, and um, and um, I, um, I look to hear some more about it soon. The um, also like to thank uh, Matt and his team um, and everyone who's. Uh, been working on um, on the testing regime that that was presented as well. Um, it's definitely uh, also new territory, and we, that requires a lot of attention, and a lot of a lot of work, and um, so I, I do appreciate that as well. Um, there is a a um, subgroup of the diversity committee, the culture of care working group. Um, that it would that will be meeting uh, this Wednesday at uh, 7 p.m. Um, if you want to uh, get the invitation, please email Matt. Um, that's it. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, Jasmine, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, it was my first wellness meeting uh, last month, I believe. And I had the privilege of facilitating, um, getting other personnel, people who wanted to join and who could contribute to the committee. So the two people that I had recommended, uh, their names were Shade Martin. Um, she is a plant-based wellness, all things health, holistic, um, esthetician and she does her own meals, kind of like Meals on Wheels in a way. And um, she told me that she was very interested and intrigued by the meal plans that we have for the district. And it was her first time actually hearing that a district has a garden. So she was very intrigued to um, keep working with us. And she went off uh, being a hit, everyone loved her. And the other person is Shanir Davis. She is a sexual health and wellness um, consultant. So she runs her own workshops and she does her own um, different movements. And she also is contracted within different schools, uh, mostly doing high schools, helping the um, older children out with certain topics in that whole arena. And um, she also was very interested and um, they both pretty much mesh very well with what we're doing in the wellness committee. So I think they wanted to do some videos pretty much because you can't come into the schools right now, of course. So they wanted to record some videos, um, maybe some DIY recipes and like already written out questions for sexual health and things of that nature. So it went, it went really well. I was really excited about it. So that's all I have to say. Thanks, Jess. Um, John? Um, I'm not a part of like any committees or anything like that yet, but um, my only board comments are is to just make everyone on the board um, and anybody listening aware that um, I've been working with an organization called Melon Unchained on everything that we discussed tonight, referring to the CRS framework. And um, if you are looking to do any more, you know, further work and advocating for, you know, more, more money, um, towards the framework or anything. And we will be also protesting in Albany uh, for, and those are one of the reasons if anybody's interested, you can please contact me at um, John Galloway Jr. 30 at gmail.com. And uh, thank you and everybody have a good night. Thanks, John. Uh, Flora? Hi, yes. So uh, I'll start uh, with the wellness meeting, which um, Jasmine uh, discussed already. Um, so essentially, yeah, we did some breakout sessions to talk about how we can accomplish our goals. And um, we, we were moderating different sessions. And um, 
I think it was it was small but successful. As Jasmine said, it was it it was um, it was definitely productive. Uh, so the next step is we're having our next meeting this Wednesday at 3.30 on Zoom, um, and that link will be uh, sent around tomorrow. Uh, and the plan is to come up with one or two action items, sort of tangible next steps toward each of those goals and assigning um, people to be responsible for those steps. And the aim is to be able to report back on progress um, on those specific steps in the January meeting. Um, the the um, January meeting, I don't have it right in front of me, but it's going to be the last Wednesday in January at 3.30. Uh, so that is the, the plan for wellness. Um, last month, we also had a, um, a committee meeting for um, public relations, advocacy, and legislation. Uh, and that was also um, a good uh, discussion. We're talking more about efforts to increase our the impact of our advocacy. And um, one idea that we've I've discussed in comments previously was finding a way to partner with other boards in the region to sign on to advocacy statements. Um, so basically, when these formal formal letters are sent, there's a list of boards at the bottom, multiple boards instead of just one. Um, and you have multiple districts sharing the same message. Uh, we've been reaching out to different organizations to see how this could be done. Uh, one organization in particular, the Lower Hudson Education Coalition, they have a great online resource for their advocacy. And um, I reached out to them and asked about making this kind of advocacy a region-wide effort. Uh, and they're interested. And um, the idea being that, uh, you know, when you go onto one of these platforms as an individual, you can, you can find a template that an advocacy statement template, you can sign on to it and send it. But instead of as an individual, it's it's almost like you're sending it as a board. Um, obviously, there are a lot of logistics and, and things around that, but they they were um, interested in the idea and they're bringing it up at their next meeting to discuss with their steering committee. Uh, that's happening before the end of this year. So that's exciting. Uh, we also um, developed some advocacy statements that are on the agenda tonight. Um, around culturally responsive education. I was really excited to hear the presentation and I'm just glad to see that it's becoming, that there's sort of uh, more inertia around it. Um, so that's, you know, specifically about the assembly bill um, mandating that framework uh, and also um, state support for public schools who need to conduct COVID testing to keep their buildings open. Obviously, since these are both on the board agenda, they're, they're really big issues right now. Uh, and things that uh, everybody needs to talk about. Um, we also discussed the launch of the new website and, and we're moving toward that. I had a question for you, Matt, if you have a sense of a general date for launch at this point. Um, it's gonna be January sometime, but we have the template and things are being flipped over into it. So I think, I think we'll have sort of the the draft, I don't know the lingo, the draft website, this is not for the public uh, before winter break. And then we'll be able to probably have it launched probably first or second week of January. This okay, semester. great. We had a little bit of a delay with Blackboard um, processing the whole thing for some reason. Um, I won't get into that, but it is all done and we have the template and things are moving now. Okay. Great, thank you. I, I just want to emphasize, I think it's going to be such a good and important tool and I'm, you know, for for parents in the community and I'm excited to see uh, where it goes. Um, and the next meeting uh, for the uh, Public Relations Committee is Monday, January 4th next year. And that's all for me. Thanks, Laura. Um, Craig? Um, I think I'll pass. I don't really have any comments tonight. Thanks. Alyssa? Yes, good evening. Um, so the policy committee had our last meeting on uh, November 30th. The policies we reviewed that night will be on the agenda for our next board meeting. We have a bunch of policies on for tonight that were from two meetings ago because we had a bit of a backlog. Um, so we're working towards the goal of having an updated new policy manual uh, 
on our website, downloadable, searchable, annotated policy manual that um, we are working towards having that ready for the end of the year. And that will be on our beautiful new website. So we're looking forward to that. And our next policy meeting will be January 4th, same night as the public relations. And I believe that's at seven o'clock on the 4th of January. Yes, that's all I have. Thank you. Um, and um, I just wanted to remind, uh, first of all, I want to thank the board and Matt for um, participating in the retreat we had with Duchess Mediation last week. I thought it was really important for us to come together in that way. Thanks for your participation there. Um, I also wanted to remind everyone that our audit committee will be meeting on Thursday night at 7 p.m. We are going to um, have to choose a chair of that committee. We haven't had a chair till now or up to now. Um, we'll be creating our charter where we will decide what our committee is going to look like. We have an option with this committee, this particular committee, um, of inviting outside expertise in. And um, so we can decide about that. And if we do decide that, how we will um, locate those members. And then we'll also have an, an update from our internal auditor. Um, and uh, that's it for me. Nor I did want to say, you know, normally we would be trying to come together, the board and the um, administrators. That's obviously not happening this year, not being safe, but I just wanted to thank everyone for their hard work. Um, I, I really did not think we would still be open this time this year. And um, I'm really proud of this district for that. I, I don't know who follows um, uh, Mrs. Pomerico on Twitter, but she is an all caps tweeter of pride <laughs> in this district. And, um, and I think a lot of people are feeling that way. And, um, and I think we have a lot to be proud of and, and a lot more hard work to do. So thanks for everyone to everyone for sticking with it. Um, moving on to new business, we have, um, the first item is actually just to approve our board goals that we talked about at the last meeting. Does anyone have any questions about that? If not, um, can I have a motion to approve the 2020-2021 school um, year board goals? So moved. Alyssa. Second. Alyssa. Flora, comments or questions? Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 9-0. Um, the second item is um, our advocacy statement in support of the Assembly Bill A3648A, which, is, which mandates a culturally responsive education curriculum and standards for all grade levels. And um, in a rare case also, uh, proposes funding. Um, do we have any comments or questions about this? I wanted to make one quick comment um, about the wording of the of the um, statement. Uh, you'll notice in the first sentence it says the below assigned school districts fully support assembly bill. Um, the reason for that, you know, is um, we you know, we're hopeful that this new, uh, this new way of doing things might work. And maybe this would be um, a, a first stab at an advocacy statement that we would share with other boards. Um, but if that doesn't um, happen, uh, I don't, I'm not fully clear on the process of, of how, like when this would be sent, but uh, when it would be sent, if, you know, if it's just us, that first sentence would need to be, would need to be adjusted. Amended. Yeah. And I did, I wanted to mention, I did go on to our, the NISBA um, officer forum and ask about that. Um, I haven't gotten any direct bites I and mean, a couple people seemed a little bit interested in knowing more. So I thought I would actually just post any letters or statements that we write there, just so people are aware and hope that it catches on that way as well. And I obviously would share the Lower Hudson Education Coalition um, work if they once they get that together make a motion that we accept the language in the advocacy item uh, with the flexibility of changing that for a sentence if needed okay thanks Anthony do I have a second 
Flora seconding. Uh, are there any other comments or questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? I'm also in favor, passes 9-0. The third item in new business is um, a letter calling for support um, of COVID testing. And as you know, just hearing Matt's superintendent report, we realize how complicated and what a huge effort this is. Um, the tests are free, but, but nothing else is. So I think this is really important. Um, are there any comments or questions about this? Yes, John. Um, I just have a question about, you know, um, how we were talking about earlier about um, pulling kids out of class um, and like throughout this whole entire COVID testing are like they going to be notifying parents immediately like as in like, you know, like before they pull the kid out of class, like are the parents going to be notified like, hey, you know, like we're going to be doing COVID testing today. And are they gonna be like consenting? Um, yeah, we before anyone gets tested, parents would have a consent, uh, have to give consent. But that being said, uh, I, I after hearing all the districts that have done it, I, I think I don't wanna do it that way. I don't wanna just kind of pull kids out of class. So what we will most likely do is uh, either do some sort of delayed start or go remote for a day just to try to test as many people as possible with their parents, like with them. Um, uh, Terrytown and Ossining, they did it slightly different from each other, but they were both, I think, yellow zone districts and they did it where the parents could be involved in the process. So uh, that's my sense of how we would try to do it. Um, so I, I don't like the idea of just kind of pulling kids out and and testing them. So yeah. I think we would try to do it in a family friendly way. Okay, yeah, that's that was my only question. Any other questions? Can I have a motion to accept um, this advocacy letter? So moved, Anthony. Second. Anthony, Kristen, any questions or comments beyond that? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I'm also in favor, so it passes 9-0. Great, thank you guys. Um, we, I was hoping to also send some language about the transportation aid, but that's that's sort of a faster moving thing and I, I didn't exactly know what to say there. Um, it looks like there is gonna be, um, the state education department has, um, or the regions have asked for a, an amendment of the of the state education law that states that buses um, can only, that transportation aid is only good for buses that are carrying children. Um, and there was some back and forth about what dates they were gonna accept that for. And it looks like they're asking for the entire thing at this point. So um, hopefully we'll have more information about that in January. I think the governor could actually just take care of it under his executive order, but um, he seems to be choosing not to. So moving on to the consent agenda. Um, as I mentioned before, this is pulling 11.5 um, F9 and 11.19. Um, the consent agenda, the use of the consent agenda permits the Board of Education to make more effective use of its time by adopting a single motion to cover those relatively routine matters which are included. Any member of the board who wishes to discuss individually a particular piece of business on the consent agenda may so indicate, and that item will be considered and voted on separately, thus preserving the right of all board members to be heard on any issue. Would anyone like to pull anything from the consent agenda? I'd like to pull uh, 13, 15, 16, 17, and 18, and 34. 13, 15, 16, 17, 17 18, 18, and 34. 34. Okay, can I have a motion to approve 11.01 .01 through 11.35 less uh, 11.13, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 34? 
So moved. Second. Kristen and Alyssa. Are there any comments or questions about those items? Um, I just want to say congratulations to um, Erica Gardiser on her tenure. Alexa. Alexa, thank you. I was looking for it. Thank you, Alexa. Congratulations. And thanks for the donation of the instrument from the instruments from the Springer family. Any other comments or questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I'm in favor. Passes 9 0. Um, can I have a motion to approve 11.13? So moved. Anthony. Second. Sorry, was there a second? Oh, second. Anthony's, oh, Anthony and Flora both, sorry. Okay, Flora, Anthony and Flora. Comments or questions? The, um, there's, it's very vague. No attachment, no amount, no, no uh, the, uh, specifying details to kind of narrow down such a, such a vague motion, uh, such a vague action. So. so technically the board has to approve any cash that's returned. Um, I can get you the report. It's only one duplicate payment and three overpayments. Um, so technically they are, they are owed back to the taxpayer. We just have to have a board resolution to approve that before we can return money. Sure, but, but all our resolutions have some, some specificity to it. We don't sign blank checks. Well, it's, I, I can get you the detail. Um, if you would like to do that, but that is actually just a representation of money that is not due to the district. That is not our money that we need to return to the taxpayers. But if you'd like, I can get you more detail. Can you provide the detail now? I don't have it. I don't know it off the top of my head now. Is it? I'd have to ask the tax collector for it. Is it urgent for tonight? Um, well, you're holding up people's payments back until January if we don't vote on it tonight. Okay. That's. Uh, I don't still don't see the the issue. You don't see the issue of holding it up. I, I don't have. See, Anthony, it's not a debate, right? You said your point, and that's the reason why you're going to vote the way you're going to vote, right? Well, I, I mean, I I think that there should be something in there to specify what this one duplicate and three overpayments are. I don't think that. Um, if we find another overpayment and we swap it out, that that's supposed to be what we're supposed to be doing tonight. Not that I think it's gonna happen, but there should be some specificity to, to how we vote things. I'd like to make a comment. Go I really ahead. think we've had this discussion before where we have proposals that don't have the backup for us to read. And I'm disappointed to see that we have several coming in on the agenda here. So, um, I'd be, I'd be inclined to uh, table it. I would second. So are you amending the motion to, you're putting a motion to amend it, to table it, Craig? No, it's, it's not an amendment. I'm moving to table. I mean, you're moving to table Kick it. Kick it over so. to the next meeting. Yeah. And Anthony, you're, you're the seconding. details. Yes. So are there any comments or questions about that, that just for new board members, that would just mean that it would be moved to the next meeting uh, for further information to be added. And then, but as with the stipulation that Anne-Marie said that it would could impact people not getting their money back until a later time. Correct. Are there any comments or other comments or questions about it? Are people aware that they're owed money? Yes. And doesn't this impact some privacy aspects? I mean, that's where the fine line is with the divulging so much, Amory. Right, um, not giving the, the total information. We can give property um, ID, mm -hmm. lot, lot, and, block and lot, and amounts, but not taxpayer names. I'm I'm inclined to move this forward with the with um, hearing the the broader point that. Anthony and Craig are making about the um, the desire for more specificity, and that's something that to work towards as a goal. Um, if people are aware and expecting payment, it's not their fault that they have not um, 
met our standard of information. So I'm inclined to vote against the tabling and just vote in favor of this, but not in with any malice towards the point you guys are making. Yeah, I apologize. I missed it um, during agenda setting and I'll definitely be looking closer. I would agree. It would be nice to give them their money back before the before the new year. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. I, I think uh, saying that and then keeping in mind, you know, moving forward that as a general practice, yeah, some information would be would be good. I see that point as well. Okay, so just wanna, you know, I just yeah, I just want to say I respect everyone's opinion. Um, I'm definitely not gonna vote to pass this. Um, you know, I, I just personally I take it as my you just share responsibility, but I do respect everyone's opinion. Yeah, I agree with you, Anthony. And uh, I just, I mean, in terms of privacy, all tax records are public and online. If somebody wanted to look them up, I don't think that's a reason not to do it. I think that it's just, um, it's just, we're looking at practice here. And so what we need to improve is our practice and being, and being provided with the the amount of information we request in order to perform these duties. But I think this is one of those situations where people have been, are expecting this, that this is not their fault. It is on our end that we need to have more detail. So um, all in favor of tabling. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Opposed. Opposed. Um. So I have Anthony and Craig in favor and everyone else opposed, including myself, I oppose. So it passes seven to two, is that correct? It fails two to seven. It fails two to seven, sorry, sorry. Um, so, um, but can we amend this motion so that, that, that the material is added to the agenda for the future? Is that so can I have a it's motion? A comment. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah I don't know if it's comment that uh, we're making that we'd like to do motions it. for something of the future. Are you doing a motion to this item or are you doing asking to do a motion to items of the future? I'm motioning to amend approving this item with just so that it can be that the information can be provided so that when people look back at the agendas, they will see this information. I mean, like included the minutes or something? How? Yes. The co it can just be put in the content. Can it be put in the public content? Yes. OK. So can I have a, a second to that motion to amend it? Are there any comments or questions? Anthony, you look confused. Uh, no, it, it may, makes sense. I don't know which Anthony, I'm sorry. Sorry, Anthony White. It's not something, I don't think it needs an amendment. It's, you're not changing the, the, the vote. Really? Like that, it's a process piece of- Well, your, what, we're, what we're voting on right now is pretty much a blank agenda item. And so I'm asking that when, that the agenda item be amended to have more information on it. So then you can't vote on this if you're asking to add the, what specific are you asking to add? Then it's an open book as to what, what you want added. The amount. Well, in racing, this is a specific, these are specific items that are being refunded. And so I'm asking that those amounts and lot numbers be provided. So then I think you need to amend it with the specificity as you just said. It could be a it could be a separate motion altogether. It doesn't have to be an amendment. All you're really doing is 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 adding more information to the report out that wasn't previously provided in the meeting. Right. So if you want to make it a separate motion, that's, I mean, that's probably more cleaner, more clear, I guess. Okay, well, so let's, let's close this motion. So uh, all in favor of 11.13. Um, Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. So it, I have Anthony and Craig opposing, so it passes. I am in favor, it passes. No, no, no. no. No, I'm not opposing it. I'm just not voting. He's abstaining. You're abstaining. 
Sorry, you're breaking up a little bit. Okay, so it passes seven to one because you opposed it, right, Anthony? Mm -hmm. Okay, passes seven to one. So um, then can I just have a motion to add the uh, amounts and lot numbers to 11.13 into the public content? So, so moved. Oh, oh, second. Anthony, Anthony moved it, I'll second it. Anthony, Kristen, comments or questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Opposed. And I am in favor, so it passes eight to one. So I'd like to make a motion to um, accept 1115 through 1118. Do I have a second? Second. Kristen, comments or questions? Again, the same issue. The lot numbers were provided, but no amounts. <clears throat> Anne Marie, do you see an issue with? Um, I can provide. I can provide the documentation that we receive from the assessor, um, and I can attach it to um, the content on this board meeting, so Kelly can include it in the minutes. Okay, great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. So, pass, so you're you're opposed, Anthony? Mm -hmm. I'm in favor, so it passes eight to one. Um, so, do we need? Should we make a motion to add that content there as well, just for so it's official? I'd like, I'd like to make a motion that the missing content be added after the fact, but included in the minutes. Do you have a second? second. Kristen, uh, comments or questions? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Uh, and I'm in favor, so it passes nine to zero. Make a motion to accept 11.34. Kristen, second. Comments or questions? So there's this two there's two open to the publics on that one. Um, I missed this policy meeting, I believe. Um, was that intentional or was that? That was not intentional. Um, two open to the public. Yeah, no, it's supposed to be removed from. I'm not sure how it got to be number ten. Actually, it never was that. Um, thanks for catching that, Anthony. You know what, can we just um, send this back? Because I have well, some other thoughts about it. Okay. So table. I make a motion to table 11.34. Uh, second. second. Also second. Comments or questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. I'm in favor, passes 9-0. Thank you. Okay, um, can I have a motion to adjourn to executive session to review the employment history of a particular individual? The board is not expected to take action after executive session. So moved. Second. Laura. Um, and and Anthony got locked yeah. out or something. I mean, I, I know it's the end of the meeting. Um, yeah. He just texted me. Is he in the <laughs> waiting room? Um, well, we can we can vote. I guess this you can matter. see him there. He he's popping off up. He's right there. It's like a mountain landscape. There he is. There he is. Where you go? <laughs> okay. Well, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Aye. Um, so is is Anthony here for that vote? I don't. Anthony, Anthony, Sorry. did you hear? He's connecting to audio just now. Okay. Anthony, we just voted to. Go to exact. Go to exact. What was the issue with the 34? Oh, it has um, opened to the public twice. And I think it should, I, I think we should talk about whether or not to just, I mean, I, I, I guess I thought we did talk about moving student presentations and parent groups to, to the front of the meeting as well. Oh, okay. Sent it back. Um, so we're just voting on going to second exact. Okay. 
All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, thank you. That passes 9-0. Have a good night, everyone.